You are listening to the Effective Statistician Podcast, the weekly podcast with Alexander Schacht and Benjamin Pieskel, designed to help you reach your potential, lead great science and serve patients without becoming overwhelmed by work. This is episode number 81, Learning from Leonardo da Vinci, an interview with Trisha Andrew. <music> Now, I'm a really, really big fan of Lord of the Rings. I have actually read the series a couple of times. I watched all the music, movies around it. And um, I really love it because it's such a great book in terms of all the stories in there, all the different stories, how they are built up, the characters, everything around it. And storytelling is actually something that is quite quite fundamental in the way we communicate and the way we uh, lead others influence others and so this episode is all around storytelling and it has some really really surprising features in it so if you want to know what sharks visualizations storytelling and leonardo da vinci all have to do with each other then stay tuned for this Storytelling is also one of the great leadership um, things that play a role in communication because through stories you can get alignment, you can influence others, you can have an impact on others. And it's just one piece in a bigger puzzle of being a good statistician, an effective statistician and the leadership skills that you need to develop as an effective statistician. And in order to help you with um, developing these leadership skills, Gary and myself have has created the Effective Statistician Leadership Program. It's a program designed for statisticians to strengthen your leadership skills so you can maximize your impact at work even if you don't have direct reports. It's a mixture of webinars, podcasts, and moderated small group discussions so that you can easily fit it into your day-to-day -day work. We have a focus on pharmaceutical statistics, but it's really aimed at all levels of statistician because we believe all statisticians can be leaders. We have only a limited capacity for this program and the enrollment ends end of October or when we have reached this capacity. So if you listen to this episode in October, go to theeffectivestatistician.com slash course and say you can register for the program. This podcast is created in association with PSI, a global member organization dedicated to leading and promoting best practice and industry initiatives. Join PSI today to further develop your statistical capabilities with access to the quite brilliant video on demand content library, a lot of webinars that are coming regularly and much, much more. There's only a reduced rate available for the non-high income countries at 20 pounds and high income countries pay just 95 pounds, which is also good value for money. Visit the PSI website at psiweb.org to learn more about PSI activities and become a PSI member today. Welcome to another episode of the Effective Statistician and today... It's again my co-host Benjamin with me here. Hi, Benjamin. How are you doing? Hi, Alexander. Very well. Thanks. <laughs> And we have a guest here um, from the States. Hi, Trisha. How are you doing? Hi, everyone. <laughs> Very good. So, um, Trisha, before we dive into the topic of today, which has a little bit to do with sharks and a little bit to do with Leonardo da Vinci, uh, maybe you can first uh, tell a little bit, little bit about your background, your um, history, and especially what your passion is uh, at the moment uh, in your profession. I, I kind of had a different path into analytics, and I started out uh, 
in, I grew up in Kentucky, which is a very rural area. And, and my daddy raised a, he worked on a farm and he had a store and a post office. And so I was used to working on the farm, but I went through a journalism program and then I got interested in technical stuff and I started working with IBM doing technical writing and I, and I just love the tech. And when I went to a different company, they asked me to start writing processes for a quality group. And then I realized that I needed to understand data better so I could understand the processes better. And I learned how to do uh, SAS programming, which I really love SAS because the bar is really low. You can learn it within a few days. And I'm, you know, I had no background in that and was very powerful within a week. I could do all kinds of things. And then through that, I started doing business intelligence and uh, doing metrics for call centers. And then I started writing books about uh, SaaS tools. And now uh, now here I am finally uh, just a data visualization expert, what I like to call myself. Um, okay, very good. And um, your company, Zencos, what, what is yes. that about? Zencos, we do uh, data science as a service. So we work with a lot of uh, banks and we work with a lot of really uh, big manufacturing companies. We uh, help fight crime. So we look at anti-money laundering techniques. Uh, we do some forecasting to help people better figure out where to place advertisements. Uh, we have also just uh, consulted and showed them how to get more value out of their SaaS tools. We do that a lot as well. Yeah, and now you need to absolutely talk about the sharks. So <laughs> we actually moved this interview by a week because of some meetings with sharks. So, so how? Tell us about how that came along. <laughs> so one thing Zincos likes to do is we we like to help the community. And I was on Twitter one day, and I don't know if you guys are familiar with a group called O Search, but. What they do is they tag great white sharks. They just put a little um, a transmitter, a satellite transmitter tag on their dorsal fin. So you have to go catch them to do that. But you put the, the tag on their dorsal fin, and then you let them go out into the ocean. And any time that that dorsal fin comes up to the top of the water, it sends a signal to the satellite and a tweet. <laughs> So, okay. <laughs> so there's a uh, Mary Lee Shark. It was um, she had the tag on for five years before the battery went dead. But she's got over a hundred and thirty thousand Twitter followers. I mean, that's more than I have. And she loves to interact and talk about the ocean and talk about her sharky experiences. And to, to make a long short story short, they said, "Hey, we need some help." Uh, who wants to help us? And we said, hey, we'll help you. We would love to tell data stories and look at your data and see what we can help you do. Awesome, awesome. And this is all to help save the, um, the environment and, and especially the sharks, yeah? Yeah, they are they are uh, conservation. Well, I don't really want to call them conservation. They do uh, data collection toward keeping the... Uh, The ocean's safe because the founder, uh, Chris Fisher, who I just adored, his whole thing is about how do we make sure that our children are able to enjoy the ocean? And he loves to say, you know, I want to make sure that everyone who wants to eat a fish sandwich in the future can. And I agree with that. And part of that is keeping the uh, apex predator in the ocean safe. That's really, really awesome. Uh, and a really nice story about how we as um, scientists, data scientists, statisticians can help not only with uh, patients, but also with the environment just by helping other scientists to, to better communicate about their data. And um, as we are talking about big scientists, yeah, we have, um, right. we are talking also about Leonardo <laughs> da Vinci. Today. That's a good segue, so, so. isn't it? <laughs> But but before we dive into that, um, mm -hmm. you, you mentioned um, data stories. So so what for you makes a great data story? To me, data stories. Well, see, a lot of people they want to just inform with the data story, but I think if I'm going to the trouble to put data together, and I'm going to analyze it. I want to persuade you to a new viewpoint. And so I think data stories, they should not only inform, but they should persuade. 
Uh, and maybe the persuasion is going to be that, like, for instance, if I'm able to tell you that most of those big white sharks are seven miles from shore, they rarely ever get that close to shore. That gives you a new point of view about the sharks, because if you're thinking about Hollywood, you're thinking, well, Mary Lee is just lurking right by the dock waiting yeah. to eat me. <laughs> And that's not the case. And so I think uh, like we did a webinar with uh, SAS and we talked about the shark's migratory patterns and we talked about what is uh, common behavior for the sharks and what, uh, you know, what can you expect them to do? And and uh, Chris Fitcher even made the point that if you go down to the beach and you see um, the birds diving into the water, that means they're fishing. So there's fish there. And that could mean other predators are going to be there to eat the fish. But it's this persuasion and it's this informing you that now you'll be persuaded that, oh, okay, well, if I do go down there and I see this activity going on, then I need to go to a different part of the beach. I can't swim there safely at that moment. So to me, data stories have to persuade. And I talk about that a lot of how, you know, it doesn't mean that you're always going to be persuaded the very moment I tell you something, but... Uh, over time, you can persuade yourself. Okay, awesome. So basically, a great data story is something that achieves the results in in the audience. Right. Exactly. Okay. Okay. Very nice. So, but now, um, why Leonardo da Vinci? So, <laughs> what what do you have to do with Leonardo da Vinci? Maybe get just a little bit of background to that story. <laughs> It's a storytelling evening, this night. <laughs> <laughs> I really, I just really appreciate uh, Leonardo da Vinci. And as I was, um, I was getting ready uh, to go to Global Forum last year, and I thought I need a way to talk about data communications, and I want to talk about it the way a master talks about it. And when I think about like a, a master, I, I think of like some of these great artists, because I think a lot of data visualization people kind of see ourselves as artists right maybe maybe not maybe we shouldn't but we do and when you think about da vinci like he i I would call him the world's greatest artist i think most everyone knows who he is maybe not everyone but i think he is extremely famous and he lived over 500 years ago and he still makes a mark today right yeah yeah for Especially if you're in Italy, then you basically can't avoid stepping over him. <laughs> <laughs> that's even true in the United States. So that's quite a re- that's a remarkable thing to have. And I think he, in the end, he only had like uh, twelve or fifteen paintings. That he wasn't very prolific artist compared to other artists that you know, like Monet, who just painted his little heart out. So that's what got me interested in him. Okay, so so and you you had a you had an article about Leonardo da Vinci. Mm-hmm. Um, you wrote something about the techniques, you know, the best techniques to your data. So there there are several points that you mentioned in this article. So maybe you can just uh, uh, we can walk through the the points and kind of trying to understand why um, you rely back to Leonardo da Vinci and how he is teaching us already 500 years ago, um, you know, the best techniques to our data today. Yeah, okay, let's do it. Okay, so what's technique number one? Well, I think you need to show the data's soul. Do you like that artsy language, the data's soul? Uh, yeah, yeah. T- today we are really artistic here. <laughs> That's completely fine. And to be honest, I think as a statistician, you're a scientist, but there's also a lot of art in it. So, so um, around choosing the right techniques, uh, balancing off, you know, pros and cons of many different ways. Um, and then thinking beyond just the, the numbers effect, you know, interacting with the uh, other scientists, interacting with non, non-scientists. non There's a lot of art in there as well. So, so um, data soul is great. So what do you understand by data soul? Well, so Da Vinci said that if you're a good painter, that and by the way, he left over. He had notebooks. I think when he was 35 years old, he started keeping notebooks, and it was his diary and journal. And he would just record his thoughts and record his ideas, and he would draw in them. And that's how come we know so much about his life 
And that's probably also the reason that uh, he is uh, as well known as he is because we have so much information about him. But he said a good painter has, has two things they're trying to do. They're trying uh, to not only just paint the object, but to show the intention of the soul. And that's really what we're doing with data so often. We're, we're trying to show not only here is the data, so I can show you a line chart or I can show you some probabilities, but I've got to interpret that for you, just like with the data story. I've got to explain what that data is trying to say. I've got to um, show it is the soul of the data. And, and because I think the three of us work so intimately with data all the time, we really know that it does speak and it does have different values that it imparts at different times. So basically, it also means you need to set the data in perspective. You need to give it, you know, an environment uh, that, that it, you know, can shine. As, you know, in a in a good painting, you have kind of the, the uh, not just the, the core and the center of it, but the environment that kind of helps it uh, be understood and, and put into perspective, all these kind of different things, yeah. Right. If you think of the Vitruvian Man, uh, the, and probably a lot of people are familiar with this, where uh, it's that some people think it is Da Vinci, but it's the man standing in the circle with his hands outreached and he's kind of uh, he's standing out. Mm -hmm. But they're saying that that's, you know, he was showing the proportions. So that was the soul of that man is showing his proportions and uh, helping you understand how, how, his, how long his arms were and how long his uh, legs were within that circle and the perspective of that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, by the way, we'll, of course, put a link to the respective article in the show notes. So, um, if you want to find more out about that and, um, you know, if you're maybe just running now or driving or doing something else when you can't go to the show notes, just go to the effectivestatistician.com and there you'll find a link to, to the articles that we are speaking about. And in the article, you also see the picture yeah, of yeah. the man <laughs> in the circle. <laughs> exactly. I have it open right now. I know. <laughs> and I had to look up how to say Vitruvian man because I'm like, oh, I don't know how to say that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. After showing the soul, what's the next detail or the next technique to, to have a look into? Well, one of the things that uh, Da Vinci did, so he wasn't just an artist. He was... He was into all kinds of things, and I'm going to say he was a medical examiner because he was one of the first people to uh, uh, do autopsies and then kind of draw what, what he saw. <laughs> This sounds gruesome when I'm talking about it, but uh, when you're looking at uh, his artwork, and I do have that in the article, you can see that maybe before that, other people hadn't thought about the mechanics behind How do you smile? What are the exact mechanics behind that? And if you look at some of his artwork compared to other people of that time, you can see that he has captured the muscles when he draws that. He's got that muscles that he shows how someone smiled or, or how their arm is moving. And you think about the extreme amount of detail that he's putting into that painting of just understanding the underlying uh, skeletal structure. But that's what we do with the data every day. And you have to go into that data and you have to understand these very specific details about it. You know, you have to understand these different percentages and how this applies to that one and what you can leave out of the data and what you can add in. And there, there's a lot to thinking about that detail. And that's very an important part of uh, analyzing data. Yeah, I think also when it comes to visualizing data, if you have a good visualization, you have a lot of focus on the details, is, is my perception. It's, it's sometimes, you know, you see, uh, you know, before and after in terms of uh, visualizations, you know, some visualizations that were just derived using the standard template from a software, and then you put a lot of effort into it and have a lot of um, care for all the details. And then afterwards, the, the figure the, the looks just, just, just much better. So that, you know, all the, um, things that are not necessarily, 
there is there they are removed and things get aligned and you know there's not as much color in it like with the standard template but you use color more kind of sparingly and guide the um uh, the viewer to uh, with the color so i think all these details are also from a from a visualization perspective need to go in to make it really a nice nice craft Yep, that very well said. I, I agree. Because uh, even like think think of the detail I just told you. I said the sharks. I could have said the sharks mostly are out in the ocean. But when I said they're seven miles from shore, that detail had a little bit more impact than me saying they're out in the ocean. Just that very specific number I'm able to give you, that detail changes your thought about that shark. Yeah, that's also like what what makes a good picture in the, in this case with um, Leonardo, that the details of that picture. So the the when you refer to the muscles, for example, or the smile, I think this is something where where the the details of um, the background comes into into play. And I think this is this is for the data itself. It's quite important as well. It's not only the entirety of the picture. You know, just referring back to, to uh, what, what Alexander just said, but, but also, for example, the ability then to zoom in and really see, find more details, underlying details and things that are really uh, giving the, um, this, you know, the, 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 giving the completeness of the entirety of the, of the table output picture or whatever. Oh, it is. I hadn't even thought of that. Yes, that's an excellent point. Yeah, uh, especially if you have these interactive visualizations where you can dig deeper and yep. deeper and deeper in it. So, so yeah, yeah. looking first in the overall populations and maybe in a, you know, just the females and just the females over 40 or whatever and, and dig deeper and deeper in it or look into, into mm. different adverse events and, and see how they, they cluster together. Um, yes, yeah, there's, that's that's a really good point. So, so we we covered kind of uh, uh, the soul and the detail of the data. Uh, what's technique number three? Well, it's applying systems thinking. And and as I'm looking through this, I'm thinking I should have said this one first. But so uh, Da Vinci was also um, a military engineer. <laughs> So yeah, <laughs> lots of interest. <laughs> <laughs> Military engineer. <laughs> but um, he was um, really like to think about everything as a whole. So how does this whole thing go together? And there's a lot of times when I think that we don't, we, we do get maybe too detailed and we don't come out enough and think about how is this data part of a larger picture like how does this specific data set fit within an organization and what other data is related to this data and why you know why was some data columns left out and what data columns do I need and I think there's a lot of times that maybe um, when you're working inside companies that sometimes you lose perspective on thinking about this whole picture and thinking about um, how one, like, I can't just give you one metric. I have to give you lots of other information to go around that. I've, I've seen companies, they want to just measure like one, this one company wanted to just measure um, how quickly a trouble ticket could be closed. And what happened is that it started influencing the the support engineers because when you get, when I say, you know, Alexander, uh, I've, I've got your ticket and now can I close it? Can, can I close it? Because I'm getting measured on how quickly I close it. I lose interest in if I solve your problem, I'm focused on if I closed it. So that was one time where I thought they really needed systems thinking because the metrics they should have been measuring were how quickly did I close it and was the customer satisfaction there? And did they call back to get more help? You know, I, I had to have a whole system of metrics in place so that I'm not just getting one result. Mm, that, that's an excellent, excellent um, technique or excellent point to consider. I think <coughs> when, when you said that the system thinkings, I just, you know, my first thought was really these siloing or that, that, that we sometimes do also in a smaller, not only company wide, or you know, it's just really that we focus on the task that we mm -hmm. have. But we just see the task as what you just said about, you know, the time until the ticket is closed. So it's kind of the task that is on, actually on your desk, but you lose the focus on the overall picture. So you don't look around and see what, what does it fit in, into. That's an excellent point. I think this is very, 
and I'm not here. And I agree, it could it could come first for the you know in in the order because this is the overall picture. Then for <laughs> you know where where we focus on. Um, no, no, that's no, true. Um, excellent point. I, yeah. I also think that you know you could look at it in the medical perspective as well. Uh, you know, just showing how great your the efficacy of your drug is is you know not complete. You need to also show uh, was it safe enough, and and there's a balance. So, so showing. Uh, yeah, it's a complete system there. Yeah. It's it, it's similar with, as with KPIs. You know, if you just in, look into one key performance um, index, it's usually quite good to kind of contrast that with another one that kind of balances things so that you're not uh, driving behavior in just one direction, as you just said. Yeah, so, so you could combine the how fast you close it with how satisfied the customers are yeah so so then you balance things and you you know you there's there's some kind of trade-off there so uh but of course that requires a different data and <laughs> yeah there's again kind of your holistic view on, on the data is, is uh, i think quite quite important well, but like you said, sometimes we're so focused on the the task at hand, and there's there's nothing wrong with that. But in the beginning of a task, I think you do need to be thinking about the larger picture and kind of being aware of what's there and what's not there. Yeah, looking into uh, technique number four, I see the, probably the um, yeah most famous painting of uh, Leonardo, isn't it? Yes, it's the Mona Lisa. And do you know the Mona Lisa was next to his bed when he died? He did not he did not consider that painting finished. <laughs> <laughs> he he had been paid for it, but he never delivered it. I don't believe. <laughs> he uh he worked on that painting just for years. He just was never satisfied with it and uh, you, that's another one where you can see the care he took to draw her face and to consider how she looked and really trying to give that little um, slight smile where we're not sure if she's uh, smiling at us or not, right? Yeah. Have you ever seen the original in, in Paris? Yes, and I want you to know that I, in my very American rude way, muscled someone out of the spot so I could get a picture of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's you, you know if you think of how famous this picture is, and then you see it first time in real, you see it things are wow in this big hall here with all these other big paintings, and there's this little painting there on the side, and everybody is <laughs> crowding around it. You're, and it's like you're right, like the world's smallest picture. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny, but that you know when you think about the instant impact, that, that and that was some instant impact. That, that how small it, it was, how that had that uh, instant impact. But when you think about numbers, and, I, and Tufty showed this in his, one of his books, he started out by showing a table of numbers, and you don't really understand that um, they're skewed one way or the other until he puts them on a chart, and then you instantly see that. And one of the things that got me interested in data visualization, and I tell this story a lot, is I uh, had been working with one of the uh, technical support managers, and we were having this trouble where we knew we were closing our tickets on time, but our metrics just were not showing it. And it was very frustrating uh, for us because we were trying to, you know, hit our KPIs. But I finally figured out that the tickets that we had to send over to engineering because they had to, those were like real software problems. They were taking longer to resolve, of course. You know, it wasn't a simple question. And I just created a, a bar chart and I showed on one, like, here's the percentage of tickets closed in this time by uh, our technical support. And here's the percentage of closed, you know, not on time by engineering. And I showed that to him and, and I laid it on his desk and he looks at it and he goes, this is exactly what I've been trying to say. <laughs> and he ran out, he ran out, he ran down the hall to see his boss. And I'm like, okay, um, okay. 
<laughs> but I've, I've had that experience a lot where, you know, people say, that's, that's what I've been trying to say. And, and the picture says it so clearly and so instantly. And I, I know I'm successful at that point. And I like that they get excited. You know, that's the, that's the fun part for me. Yeah, I think the excitement is really important. But I think the speed is also really important, um, especially in kind of our environment where you have so many distractions and there's so much uh, time pressure. Everybody is kind of busy. You need to get your point across really, really fast. So imagine you're um, a sales rep and you have, you know, just three minutes with, with your customer you need yep. to get the point across really really fast and maybe you want to get a you know two or three points across and then you know you can't have oh here's my 30 lines page uh table and with all these numbers in it all these details in it and if we go through and now i explain you what you can see here and by the time you start scrolling through the numbers your time is up <laughs> yes exactly <laughs> mm. but yeah i think that's what we touched before about the visual the, the importance of the visualization anyway it's it's really just to get the point to get to the point right away and then you know as you said it's yeah that's what i've been looking for and yes that's the answer or whatever that's causing next questions so it's um it's very good point very good point, yeah. awesome okay let's move on to Technique number find five. I really like that one. And of course the Da Vinci the, is the picture. picture is also quite famous. <laughs> yes. So I, I call this um well Jamie who works with me, we, we call this finding the aha moments. And it really should be there there should be times when you look at the data and you, you really almost gasp. You're like, oh that, you know, there it is. That, that's what I was looking for. And Oh, that makes sense. You know, when you say things like that inside your head, that's when you found an unexpected insight. And that's when really, um, like I was trying to show with this uh, picture of uh, of the Last Supper, when I, I had looked at it a thousand times, but until I started studying it, I didn't realize how Da Vinci actually had like all of these people having different reactions uh, to Christ saying that, you know, someone's going to betray me. And some of them are saying, you know, is it me? Or they're pointing at someone or, or they're, they're shying away. Or I was looking at all the different faces and I'm like, oh, I had never really noticed some of these details. And there's even salt spilled in front of Judas. And while maybe we don't think of it today, that was considered a very bad omen at the time for salt to be spilled. And I'm like, wow, that is just full of so much detail. And when you look at the sketches in his journal, it was also the same way. But that's what I really love to find in my data is that aha moments when everything becomes clear to me. Yeah, I think this is a little bit going going back to the second point we discussed about the details. I think this is this is really um, one of the you know the importance of not not only giving giving you a picture or giving you a uh, a result but really just trying to you know uh to to guide you or and and to um to ask you to really look into the data and find more you know find more details see more details present more details i think that is that is very important that is also something that we are missing sometimes just you know when you read for example just a, a paper where we do have some headlines and then the, the information really is missing and it's just a very rough very straightforward uh, um, publication but there's not the the you know the love or the, the liking the details and all the, the information available so that's very good and and really as alexander said i love that picture yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what i also really love about this point is um that it speaks to the tension that you want to uh, create you know so you just don't want to you know give Fact A, fact B, fact C, fact D. You want to tell a story, and the story lives from its characters, from the tensions that the characters go through, and um, that's also something that you have with data. Yes, yeah, so, so you can um, 
going back to the example with the sharks, yes, yeah, so, so you can create this tension by, you know, uh, first speaking about, uh, you know, Hollywood and the shark movies and, you know, what the perception of the, of the people are and, and, um, then, uh, you know, say, okay, but, we collect data from the sharks, you know, for so long, and we have so many uh, sharks that we are tracking. And what does these, these data tell us? Yeah, so you can build up a story with with um, with a resolution, and you create tension in the audience so that people get emotionally involved. And when they get emotionally involved, they can learn something because the. The funny thing about our brain is, is you know, just facts and numbers. We are really, really hard to forget. We really easily forget. Whereas if we combine these facts and numbers with emotions and we drive these emotions through stories, then we can actually remember them. So that's why the storytelling is so important. And I think there's where this, you know, this tension from the unexpected uh, insights is, is so important. Well, exactly. And you notice that when I started telling you about the sharks, I very quickly got to Mary Lee and was telling you that she tweeted and um, and that got you engaged. You suddenly, it, she dropped that, uh, you know, she became the Hollywood starlet instead of like this Hollywood monster because we love the idea that we've got a shark out there tweeting, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, for sure, much more tweeting than I do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, in terms of wrapping up these, these um, five techniques, what's what's your overall recommendations here? Uh, I th well, if I was just starting like out in this field and I was trying to learn how to do data communications, I would really be thinking about. Not so much, well, it is part of like just really diving into the data, but also thinking about that story within the data and how do I reveal my aha moments and how do I make sure that, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of the entire system and how am I getting into the details but still keeping the big picture in mind. Um, that would be some of my uh, points to someone who was just starting out. Awesome. Awesome. Very good. Thanks so much for this really, really nice interview. I think we had a very good discussion, not only about sharks, but also about uh, data visualization and how we can learn from Leonardo da Vinci to, you know, put things into perspective, put uh, uh, the amount of detail in it to make visualizations really good, build, build tension and um, have an impact with, with the visualizations that we are creating. And I think it's, it's especially also a call for us all statisticians to put more effort into visualizations because they just are so impactful. And, um, yeah, better we do them right <laughs> than let the other, the others do them wrong. <laughs> And last but not least, to, to uh, you know, don't lose sight on yeah. the overall picture. I think that's one one of the important things. Yeah. Last point: uh, Where can find people more about you and and your work, what you're doing, Pressure? Well, they can follow me on LinkedIn. I, I try to stay updated on that, and then I write a lot for the blog for our own Zincos blog. And I write on Medium uh, and the Towards Data Science and some of those publications. But um, they're certainly welcome to follow me on Twitter. I don't bite. <laughs> <laughs> as long as you're seven, seven miles away, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks so much. And have a nice time. Speak to you next week. Sounds good. Thank you, Trisha. Thank you. I do hope you enjoyed this really lovely interview as much as I did. This show was created in association with PSI. Thanks to Rain who helps with the show in the background and thank you for listening. Please visit theeffectivestatistician.com to find the show notes and there you can also learn about the leadership program. So reach your potential, lead great science and serve patients. 
just be an effective statistician. <laughs>